Caffeine is the most widely used drug, and for generations, people have consumed coffee to fuel creative ideas and even revolutions. Here's a look at how coffee starts and how it's evolved from muddy swill to gourmet beverage. Coffee is delicate, so the taste can be delicious or disastrous if the seed of a fruit survives and thrives through a complex process that brings people together from around the world. It's incredibly labor intensive. It journeys completely across the world more than once sometimes. An infusion of water through coffee beans seems simple enough, but we've all had enough bad brew to know better. For centuries, people have tried to get it right, and in the past few decades, it seems we've finally gotten there. Everybody in specialty coffee remembers the first really good cup of coffee that they ever had, right? I remember thinking, wow, this is really different. This is good. But there's also a darker side of the trade. For centuries, in every culture, coffee has been stimulating our conversations, and now it's time for a new one about coffee itself. While studying philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, Tony Dreyfus drives a cab and needs to refuel with caffeine. A remarkable cup of coffee that night helps this philosophy student see life a bit differently. Something changed. I uh, had sort of an aha moment. I go back in, I'm like, tell me about this coffee. And he said, uh, well, it's from Sumatra. And I, that's the first moment I kind of realized that coffees could taste different from each other. You want to make sure that you're like getting all the grounds wet and also pouring basically the same level. He takes a job at Pete's Coffee, which is among the first to take a more nuanced approach to processing, roasting, and brewing coffee. Improving flavors well beyond grocery store coffee or the generic kind you get at the diner. So it's not an exact science. Of Tony becomes so passionate about coffee, he meets his dad, Jeff, at a coffee convention. Somehow, in the middle of that, we got so caffeinated or excited or something that we, we, we bought a roaster on the spot. That one batch is going to be similar to the next. A philosophy student with no real business plan. He must be an existentialist. Metropolis Coffee is born. Is it fun working with your dad? <laughs> Next question. No, I, oh my God, it's so fun working with my dad. I, he is great. When you walked in, we were playing ping pong together. We argue, we hug, you know, it's, just, it's wonderful. <laughs> A passion for coffee starts here. Abyssinia, you know it as Ethiopia. The coffee bean is the seed of a fruit, often referred to as a cherry. It's first mentioned in print in the 10th century. Initially, it's chewed. An Ethiopian legend says a goat herder named Kaldi notices his goats are excited and dancing and finds they have been eating berries from a tree. Actually, there's been an experiment. Will goats eat ripe coffee fruit? Answer, no. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's just a myth. It's, yeah. This is very good espresso because... Robert Thurston is the author of Coffee from the Bean to the Barista. As to when and who decided to chew it, uh, roast it, make a, a drink out of it, that is all lost, Larry, in the, in the midst of time. Though. The first record of drinking coffee dates back to 1474. Students from Yemen begin drinking it in Cairo. Coffee houses were almost the first place where people could get together and drink something that kept them sober. And the fact that they were doing that made the rulers in various parts of the world really nervous. What's going on? Now they get together and they talk about politics. Just the fact that people were gathering, not, not controlled, this was new. It was and dangerous. It, it was dangerous. 
As a history professor at Miami of Ohio, Thurston looked for a new way to teach globalization and social justice. Coffee offers the perfect lesson. Well, the Spaniards and the Portuguese brought Africans directly across, and if you look at a globe, it's a much shorter trip from West Africa to Brazil than it is from West Africa to Charleston, South Carolina. The terrain, the soil, the altitude was really favorable for coffee all over that area, but especially Brazil, slaves were brought in to work the land. By 1840, production explodes. Coffee is cheap. Today, Robert Thurston estimates as many as 15 million workers live in poverty. It's a brutal situation, and many, many people have looked for a long time for ways to get more money to the farmer. My answer is buy good coffee, buy really good coffee. And then you know you have some better hope that that farmer who grew it is, is getting a decent buck. There's a literal slavery in, in some coffees that people buy, literal slavery. How do you sort that out yourself? We buy a lot of fair trade coffee. Okay. Uh, we're actually the largest fair trade roaster in the state of Illinois. Fair trade coffee, like Coffee for Peace, creates the infrastructure needed to get quality coffee out of war-torn areas like Colombia. People wonder why coffee is so expensive. I think that it's, it's important that we make sure that people are taken care of. For me, it's, it's really the people, that it comes from these places, these like really interesting cultures around the world, kind of near the equator. Um, we're the stopping point in the middle, and then there are all these people that love it on the other side. So in a way, we're kind of connected both to the drinkers and to the producers, and all along the way, there's, there's really cool people. The transformation of coffee from adequate to something special takes careful cultivation, moisture, soil, altitude, and Tony's specialty, Roasting. And he's looking at the beans the last couple seconds of development, watching for that exact right moment, making sure the color and the smell are exactly right. We just realized the potential. We can't exceed it. We can definitely screw it up. When we pull it out, we think that's about as good as we can make it. Inside the roasting facility, they package the product and sample it in their own tasting room. And we wind up grinding, pouring water over it, and uh, slurping and spitting and, and evaluating. Yeah, so this one um, is from Tanzania. Uh, the acidity is just singing. It's really bright. And away from the roasting facility, they have a cafe. You know, different people have different stuff going on in their taste. I'm interested to hear what, uh, what people outside of the coffee industry think about what makes something good. This is where Tony catches up with his dad and partner, Jeff. I want to make him proud. I do. I want to make decisions that he thinks are, that's a good decision. Um, I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want him to worry. Tony admits he's not great at marketing, but unlike many products, coffee really tastes different from one region to another. I think it's still the same story. Some people drink coffee because they want the caffeine. Some people drink coffee because they love the experience and the tradition of it, you know, the, the ritual of it. Um, and a lot of people just drink it all day long and never think about it. And I think as soon as you start to try to force people to feel a certain way about something, then, then the whole thing falls apart. Oh, I, do, I love one. That hasn't stopped companies from trying to convince you to think more about the coffee you choose. Folgers suggest buying the wrong coffee could lead to divorce. And Mrs. Olson would somehow just walk into the kitchen with a grocery bag and she would say in a hokey accent, oh, making good coffee is no trick. If you use the coffee with better flavor, here, now you try Folgers. The high point of coffee consumption in America per capita is the early 1960s. The office percolator is on all the time. What's in the sweet as dip that's Coke. So what ends coffee's dominance? Coca-Cola. That's Coke. Soft drinks go way, way up because sugar and sugar syrups and so on became much, much cheaper. We now drink less coffee per capita than we did in 1961, despite all the hoopla about specialty coffee. 
specialty coffee like Starbucks. Starbucks was the tide that lifted all boats in the sense that it pulled along independent coffee shops. In 1980, there were a couple of thousand independent coffee shops in the United States. Two decades later, there are 25,000. When we roast coffee, people are excited. It fuels their passions, whether they're working in a cafe or planning a revolution or just kind of having it around the kitchen table. Improvements in navigating the intricate process of making the perfect cup means the days of the bottomless coffee pot at the diner are almost gone. And considering the way it tastes, maybe that's a good thing.